In this video, we're going over tips and tricks for brand new players to D&D, as the game definitely seems a lot more confusing than it really is. First up, let's go over how do you even play the game. D&D is a collaborative storytelling game where you basically tell your dungeon master what you want to do, and then your dungeon master, who controls the entire world, tells you what happens. The thing that makes it a game is the fact that you roll dice for activities which might be difficult and have a chance at failing. For example, you and your party members are entering a mine shaft, and you hear some noises from behind a wall. You can tell your dungeon master that you want to sneak over and see what's going on. So the DM may ask you to perform a stealth check. The difficulty for this action is determined by a number of factors, but for this example we'll just say the difficulty threshold is like 10. So, you roll a d20, and then you get an 11 on that roll, which means you successfully sneak over there and look around the corner to see a goblin patrolling. Then you decide what to do next. Do you wish to ambush the goblin and attack them? Do you want to try to talk to them and see if you can negotiate? Or do you want to do something unconventional, like collapse the entire tunnel on top of them? All of these things would constitute different kinds of roles, and the difficulty of these roles and what you need to roll in order to succeed is left entirely up to the DM, who tells you the outcome of your roles, as well as what kind of role you need in order to make to attempt any of these creative feats. So if you're just a brand new player to the game, you don't really have to know much to start, as the DM is the one who basically determines what kind of roles you're making anyway. And if you have a good DM, they'll work with you in order to help you accomplish your tasks instead of against you. If you wish to attack something, you have the attack roll, which is just a d20 as well. If you're trying to save against a magical effect or some kind of trap, generally you perform a saving throw roll, which is also a d20. And if you want to perform some kind of skill like stealth, investigating, or just persuading, that also constitutes a d20 roll. Where you get into the nitty gritty is just where your character's stats and modifiers allow you to increase the chances of that roll being higher than the difficulty threshold. So in the first example, if you're trying to sneak up to a goblin and the difficulty threshold is 10, you would need to roll 10 or higher on the d20 unless you had some bonuses to your stealth skill because you have a dexterity score which is high or maybe you're proficient in it and you get to add your proficiency bonus or maybe you just have some other class feature which allows you to increase your stealth score as well. So if you rolled a 9, you could still succeed if you simply had a plus 1 from your dex, for example, or if you had a plus 2 from being proficient in stealth. That's where things start to get a lot more complicated, but basically, you get to interact with the world by just rolling d20s and asking your DM if it's okay. Tip number two, playing the game. Everybody wants to be a player and no one wants to be a DM. And generally, that's because DMing is tough and requires 10 times as much work as being a player. So if you want to guarantee you'll have games, learn how to DM. However, it's much better to start off as a player. And it's also really nice to start off with just playing online tabletops. As even if you do play in person, it's still nice to learn the rules and basics of the game by just playing online first, even if it's a different experience. Roll20 is the most popular option you can choose because it's free and doesn't require any downloads, and has a lot of people on it. Tabletop Simulator is another alternative, although that one requires everyone to purchase something and doesn't have as many features on Roll20 when it comes to making the game more convenient to play. There are other options as well, but most of them require you to buy something and generally, you want to see if you even like D&D first before you start spending too much money on it. Number three, if you have a group that can get together reliably and play together, one of the number one reasons campaigns fall apart is due to scheduling conflicts. So, one of the best ways you can schedule a campaign is to play either weekly or bi-weekly on the exact same day and time every time. So, try to find a single day where everyone is free for about two to four hours, and be sure to play that day no matter who can make it or not. Games will quickly be cancelled if you only ever play when everybody can be there. Things happen and sometimes people just can't make it for any number of reasons. So be prepared to play without one or two people. I highly recommend just having a follower character fill in whenever someone can't make it. Where the DM basically just creates an NPC who solely exists to fill in for your party and kind of hangs out and does his own thing when everybody is there. I've been in games where we only played when everybody could make it, and we would routinely go months at a time without a game, because something always came up for someone. And then I also play a game where we play once a week no matter who shows up, and we manage to finish full campaigns in less than six months. One of the most important things a new player can have is the player's handbook. It's a very useful reference document, which isn't really the same thing as a rulebook. You don't need to read the player's handbook cover to cover in order to play your first game. You can just kind of go in blind as long as your DM is able to walk you through your character creation process. However, it is nice to know things that your character can do by rules as written. 
like how you can gain extra AC by hiding behind a tree and gaining three-fourths cover, or how you can stabilize dying party members with a simple medicine check without needing any special spellcasting or items. They can also help you create your first character, give you all the skills and knowledge you need to know how to run combat, as well as pre-reading the spells if you're a spellcaster, as a lot of the spells can be kind of complicated. It's a really good thing to know how your spells work before you start playing. Although you don't need to know how every single spell works in the game. In fact, I'm pretty sure very few people know how every single spell works in the game off the top of their head. Next up, we have a tip for role playing. When you're playing your character, you have to remember that your character might react to situations differently than you personally would. And an easy way to get into this is just to straight up just rip off characters that you like in fiction and think how they might react to things based on all the interactions you've seen them already do in their works of fiction. You're not writing a book here. You're playing a game where pretty much anything can happen. So you can treat your character like a main character in a novel and ask yourself, what would you want to see your character do if you were reading a story about them? Say you see a werewolf attacking some villagers. Would you like to read a story about how your character just ran away? That might be a good option to pick if you want to increase your survival chances of your character, but that probably wouldn't make for a good story. Although there are some caveats to this generally. Genius characters, for example, who are one step ahead of everyone, or even detectives who can solve everything too easily, like Sherlock Holmes, or even brooding characters who are loners and don't like to group up, generally don't make good characters to play for a number of reasons. Because your character won't know everything as well as Sherlock Holmes, unless you're super lucky on your investigation checks or a level 20 character. And also a brooding character who refuses every plot hook because their characters wouldn't do that is just kind of annoying to play with. But you can still play these kinds of characters if you're just a lot more flexible on their character concepts. And you realize you're going to be playing a heavily nerfed version of them. Your character might not be good as investigating as Sherlock Holmes, but they can still aspire to be that good someday. And if there's ever a plot hook where your character probably wouldn't want to do it, because they might be a brooding loner character, for example, just think instead, how can I get my character to want to do this? Next up, let's talk about a session zero. This is generally something you do for new party members who probably never played with before in order to determine the general tone of the game you're playing. If you're bringing in a super serious Sherlock Holmes-like detective and it turns out you guys are doing a dungeon crawl where you do nothing but fight monsters and almost nothing else, then you probably would not have very much fun with a super serious detective. Unless your DM throws a murder mystery in the middle of the dungeon. Or if you're playing a wacky character, like a druid who only likes to turn into frogs because they're funny, and everybody else is playing super serious characters with deep backstories and a world of political intrigue, it's probably a better idea to save that character concept for a more lighthearted game. Basically, a session zero is just getting everybody on the same page so they know how to build their characters for that campaign. You could definitely have a Sherlock Holmes-like character in a dungeon crawl and still have fun with him. You could have a wacky character in a political intrigue campaign and have it work out to great success. It's still probably better to work everything out in a session zero so that you don't regret your character choice, when you can't really do anything in the game because your character is just wholly unsuited for the situations you're in. Another thing to remember about D&D is that it's not a video game, so you don't need to play specific classes or races or roles unless your DM is a stickler about those kinds of things for that particular world. So if you want to have a full party barbarians, that's perfectly fine because the DM can do this wonderful thing and hotfix the game in real time so that you never get hard stuck in a certain scenario. If you want to play a game with all clerics or just a whole bunch of melee characters or only spellcasters with no frontliners, that's perfectly fine because a DM can just fix the game in real time in order to make sure people aren't having a bad time. There's no need to have a specific party comp, which also means there's no reason for someone to have to be the healer if they don't want to. Part of the reason people might prefer to have a party comp is if they just don't trust their DM, or if their DM is new and doesn't know how to balance things out in real time yet, or if people just really like to stand out in one particular skill and want to be the only person who knows how to lockpick, for example. In my opinion, I think the fun of the game is everything else that goes into the game as a whole and not being able to perform one specific task that no one else can do. However, that's just a preference. For some other people, they live for being able to perform one specific task that no one else can do, and get incredibly upset if someone else is able to also perform that one specific task. Which again, is something you should determine in a session zero to see what kind of party you're going to be playing with. Because some people are okay with an anything comp, 
and some people are definitely not okay with that at all. Number 8. Another thing a beginner can do is just watch a whole bunch of D&D content for new players online. Joe Kant has a whole series on breaking down each class and race, and there's a whole bunch of other wonderful content creators who pretty much dedicate their lives to explain things as simply as possible. There are some creators who are super into the nitty gritty rules to make very effective classes in combat, like Trent Monk's Temple, or channels like True Luck the Barbarian, which have videos on how to build characters to be a more RP focus, generally based around fictional characters from other media. There's also a D&D podcast, which can give you an example of how people play the game, Although, just know, people playing a game from a very popular podcast are playing to entertain a crowd, so it's generally not a good indication of how a real game looks like, as most real gamers are not professional voice actors who can get into character at the drop of a hat. And if you try to imitate them too much, you can just find yourself disappointed, or so I've heard. I've personally never ran into this problem, but I've heard about it enough online to know that probably is a problem, as my players just spend half their time arguing or metagaming, or arguing about metagaming, which is definitely nothing like any of the D&D podcasts I've ever seen. Number 9. Remember that you're playing a game with friends at a table, and that even the official rules in D&D tell you to just kind of ignore the rules if you don't like them. If one of the rules is making things awkward or less fun for everyone, try asking the table if they can come to a consensus to just ignore it. Although in my experience, the actual rules to the game are pretty straightforward and don't really hamper the gameplay of the game too much. So the only thing I can think of when it comes to ignoring rules to make it more fun would be to ignore something that's completely broken. Like 17th level characters using Simulacrum to cast an unlimited amount of wishes. Or level 1 druids being able to cast Goodberry in order to completely counter a survival based campaign. Or just the Wanderer background, which also allows you to do the same thing. Most of the rules aren't going to hamper how you play the game, they just give you guidelines on how you can do things. Which is pretty generous with what they allow you to do. And they don't even really have official guidelines on how to use most skill checks, as it's almost entirely up to your DM on what a skill check even allows you to do in the game. And last tip at number 10, this one is basically just for DMs. Don't be afraid to just use a module if you're a first time DM. I know there's this weird sentimentality in the community to look down on modules as being less effort as a homebrew game, but I think that's just a weird form of gatekeeping. A homebrew world is not better than a module, just different. A module can give you some really good ideas on how to run your own games, and Wizards of the Coast has two modules which are designed specifically for a new DM, The Lost Minds of Pandelver and The Essentials Kit. I played both of them and I personally think The Essential Kit is more fun of the two, but Lost Minds is a classic. And another thing to keep in mind as a DM, which should probably be brought up in Session Zero, is how the characters feel about player deaths. There are certain thresholds when it comes to what players are okay with, some of them are super attached to their characters and they just want to play that character in a story and don't want their characters to die. However, if they know the character is immune to death, they might be too reckless, so there should still be some consequences for a death, just not permanent character deletion. Whereas other characters are totally fine with player deaths. If that's what happens in the story, that's just what happens. And there are some players who like a super hardcore system where everybody dies all the time, like early D&D. This is definitely something to figure out before a game even starts, if a character death happens, to maybe just ask them if they want a deus ex machina to happen to save their character, or if they're okay with just letting what happened happen. Remember, everybody's there to have fun, and the DM is able to do pretty much whatever they want in order to accomplish this goal, and most DMs have fun when their players are having fun. 